How's it going, everybody? Dave Meltzer here. Next two hours, we're going to be talking pro wrestling. We're going to have Jim Cornette as our special guest with myself and Brian Alvarez. We'll be talking about uh, all of the latest wrestling news. I'm sure we'll be talking about Paul Heyman, who will appear on Raw tonight in some form or fashion. I don't know that he will be an announcer. Um, if he ends up being, I, if he ends up being the announcer by the end of the two hours, I think that tells us all we needed to know about last week's big story with Jerry Lawler. If he's not used in that role. And that also tells us a lot about last week's big story with Jerry Lawler. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How's the weekend? It was good. Nothing uh -huh. really happened, but uh, I got a lot of the newsletter done, so I am hoping, and uh, for some reason I just know this won't happen, but I'm hoping nothing big breaks in the next two days that uh, would keep me up all night Tuesday. Mm. Keep hoping, right? No such luck. Okay. Just, just uh, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, Tuesday, yeah. Nah, it's not going to happen. Um, I'm not even going to be here Tuesday night, so that makes it real tough. But I, I got a lot done, too. You know, it is so much easier for, for me when there's no pay-per-view. It's unbelievable. Oh, I know. Um, and, and now there's going to be so many, you know, like we went from last year with, uh, what, was, what ended up being the number? About 30, close to 40 pay-per-views last year. And this year, whatever that number is, it's going to be... 20, you know, probably closer to 25. That's going to make a big difference. Now, wait till next year. It could be down to, like, 15. It won't be that low. Um, but it could be, I don't know, who knows? Who knows? Cause there's, always the, there's going to be startups and things like that. Yeah. Actually, yeah. We, we have a poll question kind of on that, and that being, I don't know if the poll results for the weekend, we'll have them in a couple of minutes. The poll question, actually, for this weekend, Jim Cornette's going to be up in uh, about a half an hour, which, actually, I'm very much looking forward to having watched a whole bunch of of uh, Ohio Valley wrestling tapes this weekend to catch up, and part of his shoot interview where I heard all these stories of the early part of Jim Cornette's career. And actually, I I knew most of those stories, but very entertaining. And um, after watching the one thing, after watching Ohio Valley wrestling, there's no question in my mind, and and it's not going to happen. And obviously, the fact that he's on the show today tells you this. Jim Cornette actually would have been the best choice to replace Jerry Lawler, except he didn't want to do it. They didn't want him to do it, and it's not happening. <laughs> But uh, watching him uh, communicate, I mean, it's, it's, it's very much old Bill Watts style, which is what Jim Ross broke in with. But uh, there's some stuff, and I won't wait till he's on the show and talk to him about, um, you know, as regards that. But I was really impressed with his ability to make logical sense out of angles. I mean, I haven't watched a whole bunch of Ohio Valley, but, I mean, I hear that from people all the time that get the tapes. It's like, you got to watch Jim Cornette do commentary because... I mean, he knows exactly what's happening. He knows exactly how to tell the fans what's going on. There's no confusion. Um, he's not talking about, um, you know, how non Nitro is always, oh, well, you need to talk about the main event, even though there's another match going on right here. It's like totally getting over the product, exactly like it needs to be gotten over, and uh, that's it, what it, they it's, need. It's total, watching that show, for those of you who have been around for a long time, it's total mid-1980s, mid-South wrestling, but without... You know, Ted DiBiase. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> no Ted DiBiase in that bunch. Not knocking against those guys. They haven't been around long enough. Maybe, maybe someone will turn out to be one. But um, anyway, the poll question is: uh, What do you think will be the number two sports entertainment group in the United States one year from today? So this is March of 2002. And I don't have WWF. I'm, I'm going under the assumption. Maybe this is a faulty assumption, but I don't think it is. The WWF will be the number one group a year from today. Okay. So A is WCW. B is UFC, C is Pride, D is a foreign company like New Japan or AAA, and E is a startup domestic company, which means somebody's starting something up. I guess I could have F, and that is that there will only be one company. Let's hope that's not. But I don't want—I don't want to say that. Yeah. Although it's as as uh, each day goes by, uh, it becomes more and more of a possibility. Uh, let's see. No Dusty Rose on Nitro tonight. That fell through a couple days ago. Uh, so we got, I don't even know what, what the main event is, Lex Luger and Sean O'Hare? I haven't seen the, uh, an updated thing on Nitro. I know we got, uh, what is it, Ilk Skipper and Kid Romeo against AJ Styles and Air Paris. Mm -hmm. And uh, Easy Money's getting a tryout tonight. I think Kid Cash is getting a tryout tonight, too, but I'm not positive with that one. And Raw, I haven't seen the uh, preview yet, so we'll probably have that in, in a couple of minutes. You haven't seen any preview? Uh, just the preview as far as the, um, the preview as far as the Paul Heyman stuff. But I mean, I haven't seen the match, you know, the matches or anything like that. Okay, the matches they have announced so far: Chris Jericho versus Eddie Guerrero for the Intercontinental Title, which seems like they've done that about 15 times and there's never been a finish. So. Yeah. 
Somehow I think there won't be tonight either, but... Uh, well, Benoit's getting involved in that, right? Yeah, yeah, I'd assume. Ivory versus Lita for the woman's title. Okay, so China's going to get involved in that, most likely. Oh, boy. Dudley's versus the Hardys for the tag titles. Dudley's versus the Hardys. Now, where are they going with that? I don't know. We'll see. I would guess uh, Dudley's beat him when uh, some with Matt and Jeff screwing up because of Lita. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. And then Undertaker and Kane versus uh, Haku and Rikishi. Well, it's fine. It's only one match. Get yeah. out of the way. And also teasing the next chapter in the uh, Rock versus Steve Austin WrestleMania main event. Setup. Well, I'm thinking it's Rock and Austin against Angle and uh, Regal, maybe? Something like that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I'm thinking that, that I, I figured coming out of SmackDown they were going in that direction. We'll find out tonight. I have not heard anything more on that. Um, Scott Hall's been in Japan now for three days, and I have not heard one news story. So he's, I guess he's okay. He's made it three days. He's made it there three days. Debuted the main event. The yeah, main event, uh, first two nights. I haven't heard about, if they, I haven't heard anything about today's show yet. But, uh. Which day did he pin Nagata? Was that? That was, uh, yesterday. Okay. Yeah, in a tag match. It was Nagata and Kensuke Sasaki against Scott Hall and Scott Norton. I can just imagine Scott Hall and Scott Norton in the main event on a New Japan show. Well, you, know, <laughs> you know, I mean, my God. <laughs> but, you know, Norton's been there forever anyway. Yeah. Uh, the zero, all the reports I got on the Zero One pay-per-view, and I got a lot of them, were just raving about the booking of the show, the heat on the show. Um, so that's going to be pretty cool. Hopefully I'll get a tape of that in just a couple of more days. That was from uh, Friday. So uh, with all the matches that were set up and everything like that, so so at least that's that's cool. I guess they may do some ECW type of a thing uh, tonight. Um, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, let's see, this was on C-SPAN. It was actually taped from about a week ago with Jesse Ventura. Actually, we before talking about Jesse Ventura, XFL ratings they did two six on the overnights on Saturday, which is two tenths lower than the previous week. Which probably will translate to, see, they ended up with a 2 4, so they're probably going to end up between a 2 2 and a 2 3. So, so would that break running, the record? Um, 2 3 would tie the record. 2 2 would break the record. There was actually one show in, that did a 2 2 on Christmas Eve, but like they really don't count Christmas Eve because, you know, let's face it. No one's watching TV. I mean? Yeah, no one's watching TV, exactly. So realistically, the realistic record should be a 2 3, which was, um, with Game 3 of last year's Stanley Cup. So, uh, this one could be, uh, it could, it, it could, it will, it will probably tie the record and it may break the record. So, we'll find that out tomorrow. And, um, there's, the WR is still trying to spin that as somehow a positive. The UPN. I know, I was reading the Ross report and I was very embarrassed for Jim Ross. It was sad, you know, just, it's like, you know, yeah, you know, there were a lot of, like, you know, shows on cable that were on in the afternoon or things like that, or even at night, you know, as far as sporting events that did worse than the XFL. But, I mean, you know, you can't compare. You know, if you put the rating, the national rating of Raw, which would be, uh, let's see, if they're doing, uh, like, a, a 5-0 average on cable, that means that you're doing about a 3-9 national rating, okay? And you put that against the network programming on Monday night, it looks horrible. Because you can't you can't compare because obviously a cable rating is going to be lower than a network you know, than an NBC rating. So you've got to factor that both ways. That uh, you know, that's equivalent that's not equivalent to a two six on ESPN, that's probably equivalent to you know, I mean I mean you know, in in fairness, put it this way, it's the lowest rated show on that network in prime time. It's the lowest rated show on every major network in prime time. So therefore, it should be equivalent to the lowest rated show on every major cable network in prime time if you really are trying to be fair. By the way, I figured out, got a whole thing in this week's Observer, but um, it's basically $32 million uh, more that they're going to lose because of the bad ratings. And that's that's um, figuring... On top startup, of the $80 million? Uh, as far as the startup, um, I figure probably startup... If it's going to be, it was going to be 80 million for the first year, because I think they were considering the 80 million in losses spread over maybe two to two and a half seasons. Mm -hmm. You know, because they figured on, on breaking even on the third year. So probably the the 80 to 100 million, which are the figures that I that I heard on startup, um, would be over two seasons. So, but probably most of them the first season. But I had heard like 60 million dollars they were expecting to lose. So tack on another 32. And you're going to have about, you know, roughly 90 million in losses for this first season, which is 45 for WWF and 45 for NBC. 
I guess that there's a thing in the NBC contract where they can cancel the show in prime time, but they would have to pay like a penalty to the WWF of somewhere between ten and twenty million, and they really don't want to write that check. Well, I guess we'll find out. Uh, I guess it'll come down to: Are they going to lose more than twenty million by keeping it there, or uh, yes. would it yes. be better to just write the damn check and get it oh, over? I think with? That, I think that the affiliates are going to really pressure them to write the check and get it over with. Yeah, I don't know what another. There may maybe maybe there will be affiliates chipping in. Yeah, there also may be something where um, they may be able to get around it by putting it on like CNBC or something like that, which would be a death blow. But yeah, you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Because but, but keep it in prime time next year. Speaking of, I want to go over the poll for the uh, website on the XFL. Your XFL prediction, they won't even finish the season is A. They'll fold after the end of the season is B. C is they'll play one more season and D. They will continue playing for years to come. So okay. head up there and vote. Okay, what was the results of the, uh, the announcer poll? The announcer poll, who would you pick as Jerry Lawler's replacement? Of course, Paul Heyman was not on this list. And... Uh, Anyway, the result, 3,949 votes. We're getting a ton of votes lately. I don't know why. Bobby Heenan, 34.3%. That was the highest. Mark Madden, poor Mark Madden, only got 4.8%. Joey Styles, 10.5%. Joel Gertner, 5.5%. Tom Zank, poor Tom Zank, 5.7%. Taz, 7.7%. Mick Foley, 194 And somebody not mentioned above, 12%. So really, it was, it was Heenan by a landslide. Yeah. Now, why would that be? I mean, I know he didn't do great on the show, but he, aside from that, he hadn't done good in WCW in how many years? How Jeez, I don't that? know. It's, been a, it's been a while. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, they're 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 putting uh, you know that well, of course you know this that they're going to put cameras in the cheerleaders' locker room next next week on the XFL. You know, the one thing that was so funny when I was watching the game is Jim Ross was going like. You know, like the tagline is, in a desperate attempt to increase our ratings. <laughs> you know, they kept saying this throughout the show, like that's part of the, the script. You know, in a desperate attempt to increase our ratings, and it's like... Like the low uh, ratings are a work? Just part of the storyline? <laughs> not, not that the low ratings are a work, but that, you know, they're, they're calling attention to the fact that their ratings are terrible, which is certainly unlike what you would normally do. You know, I mean, like when Raw was down doing those 1-7s, I don't think they were on there going like, in a desperate attempt to increase our ratings, we're going to give you a phony razor and diesel next week on this show. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to put Steve Austin in the main event, and he's not going to wrestle for uh, eight weeks straight. Yeah, but they built their ratings up doing that because they have nothing else. I know. Think about yeah. that, though. They built it's like their totally, ratings up doing that. It goes totally against what you would think. But like, keep promising this main event we never deliver, and our ratings go up. Yeah. Well, Russo must have been I... sitting back there, just his mind just buzzing. Look we work. never have to do wrestling matches. That's the silliest thing to ever do wrestling matches. Yes, yeah, we're not giving them a match, and our ratings are going up. Yeah, well, that's because Austin was getting on fire <laughs> by not wrestling. <laughs> Which, you know, there's 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 something to be said about your top star not wrestling on television because it makes them something special, and you have to pay to see him. I mean, that was you know, well, WWF Sting. Yes, yeah, Sting. Well, look at WWF did that theory forever. I mean, how, how often did Hogan? Wrestle in the old in the 80s on television, except you know, I mean he he would he'd never wrestle on the syndicated shows or almost never, and when it was it was only to set up an angle. San Martino almost never wrestled on television. Um, Backlund rarely wrestled on television. I mean the WWF, that was the mindset for years and years. Is the champion would very rarely wrestled on television, and when they did, it was always to set up a big angle. I mean when I was little, I I didn't understand it. And I was always like, how come all these wrestlers come out and, and just kill these guys? And Hogan never does it. It never occurred to me. Yeah. But they were right. Yeah. Um, Jesse Ventura, this was on the C-SPAN thing a week ago. This is, this is like actually really funny. Wes Jones sent this in. Um, you know, they were asking him, you know, the, oh, this is the thing. We talked about this like earlier, like last week as well, um, about, uh, you know, why he has so, so much disdain for the press. So he gives his reasons. You know, about how they only want to report negative stories, things like that. Yeah, and the very that? next question is, well, now that you're a member of the media on the XFL, don't you feel like a hypocrite in light of what you're doing with Rusty Tillman? And Ventura's response was absolutely not. Um, that what he's doing is entertainment, and he actually has great respect for Tillman. <laughs> Oops. Oh, my God. And then... Uh, that's when... That was in the same thing where when, when he goes... When they asked him why the XFL wasn't succeeding, he said... 
Give yourselves a hand. You are the reason the XFL is not succeeding. The constant negative criticism by you guys is the reason the league is not succeeding. So, that's the reason. The press is very powerful, causing 54 million people to stop watching a football game. 54 million. They, they actually, there were actually people who printed that 54 million, <laughs> aside from the WWF, which is another weird story. Um, and then he said that uh, nobody from the league ever said they were going to be better than the NFL in any way, which is Except amazing. the guy that owns it. <laughs> Constantly. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so much for that. We're going to, um, any other news before we hit emails? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. If this were Scott, if Paul Heyman joins the WWF, joining the WWF was the reason that Vince McMahon let Waller leave, this was a very foolish move on McMahon's part. WWF has two hours of Raw, two hours of SmackDown, an hour of Heat, and a pay-per-view once a month. It makes no s sense to drop a guy like Lawler. In any event, it'll be interesting to see how Heyman's ideas are used by the WWF as far as booking goes, and how receptive the top guys are to Heyman. Somehow, I don't think the top guys are going to be dealing with Heyman. I think Heyman's going to... If they do an, an ECW invasion, which they should, I just have this feeling that it's going to be used for these guys like Perry Saturn and Albert, you know, that have no program. Yeah. Uh, this is this is quite embarrassing for the XFL. On their website today, they have a poll going, are you looking forward to the cameras in the cheerleaders' locker room next week? Granted, this is on the XFL website, right? 62% no. 37% <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see. I was I was listening to the show Friday when you were discussing Montreal. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, boy. But anyway, it, it got me to thinking, is there any chance Vince Russo never stopped working for Vince McMahon? A uh, hell of a way to take the competition. People have theorized that. I, I personally don't believe it, but uh, certainly that theory will be around forever. And it's, you know, I don't put anything past Vince McMahon. But I just kind of don't believe it. I just sense that. I don't think Russo's a good enough actor. That's my feeling. Yeah. Uh, from Ryan. Plus, that company was uh, self-destructing anyway. Yeah. It wasn't, well, like, it wasn't like they were on fire and just destroying Vince, and he just sent someone over to, uh, you know, destroy the company from within. It was already dying. Okay, but when Russo went there, and you we, we, you and I both know this, it could have been turned around, no problem. Yeah. Not no problem, it would have been a problem, but it could have been turned around. And when he was done... It was unsalvageable. It may be unsalvageable. It may very well be. This is from Ryan, who goes, Lately, Mike Tyson has been getting a lot of attention for boxing in the media, but nothing about wrestling in Japan. Is there a reason they keep it so secretive, or do American reporters not know about it? No, it's that no one takes it seriously. American reporters um, don't, you know, it, it, it's, it's a Japanese story that probably has no credence. And that's why, I mean, there's people around here who know, but all the Tyson's people know and there's nothing to it. Uh, do you know what the gate was for the May 1st, 1998 Tokyo Dome show? If that was the Inoki retirement show, it was uh, $7 million, which is the largest gate, uh, live gate anyway, in the history of wrestling, because this, like WrestleMania coming up, which will be the American record, is just over $3 million. Uh, will Paul Heyman be a heel or babyface commentator? We don't even know for sure he'll be a commentator. Uh, he'll be, I don't think he'll be either. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is from Ken Murphy. He goes, you started talking about Jack and Frank Tunney. It got me curious. Whatever happened to Jack Tunney? I think a couple of years ago, um, he and the WWF kind of had their split, and uh, that was it. Mm -hmm. He was done. And, uh, but, and uh, what's the guy's name? Carl DeMarco is now running WWF Canada. You know, the thing with an ECW invasion angle, I was just thinking about this. If they really wanted to do it right, they could now because ECW is pretty much just done. I mean, there really is no other company. They are done. Don't say that they're pretty much. Okay, they're they done. are unless unless. I was waiting for the uh, death warrant um, to be signed, but the death dead. warrant is Paul Heyman going on TV. Is the death warrant being signed? That's true. So um, anyway, if they're dead, unless they are dead. unless Vin, unless Vince McMahon is going to prop it up himself, and I'm sure that Vince doesn't want to pay that seven million dollars in debt to keep the name alive. So you know, you know, although he'll, use, I mean, I'm sure they'll use the name in their angle, but you know what yeah. I'm saying. Okay, so with no other company, they could do this right. But the only problem with like doing it right with the top guys right now is everything is building towards WrestleMania, and there's no way they're gonna, you know, screw up those plans by having somebody come in and challenge Rock or Austin or anybody like that. Oh, it's, they're not gonna be. They're not even gonna be involved in this. Yeah. David Wolbright, how about Arn Anderson as the color man in WWF or even WCW? Well, as far as WWF goes, unless WCW fires him, they wouldn't be able to take him. Um, Arn Anderson might be really, really good in that role. I, and I'm shocked that WCW never gave him uh, the opportunity to do it because I remember a couple of years ago he expressed interest in, in, in you know, uh, wanting to go on one of the syndicated shows and try out as a color guy. 
it never went anywhere. And I'm thinking, like, as good a talker as this guy is, you know, you would at least put him on one of those shows, give him a chance to, to sink or swim. Okay. It's like the story of Arne Anderson's career. Yeah, this is so weird. Not getting a chance at a million different things. Yeah. Uh, notes here. Let me see as far as... Uh, there's a lot of news from Puerto Rico. Conan was in Puerto Rico all weekend. Uh, apparently did very well there. Uh, huh. Just to let you know, the Wrestling with Shadows website and your edited commentary is still up. That's nice to know. It's still there. It's not the whole story, though. On a related note, do you know if the reason Triple H got to the ring almost immediately following the match was to protect Sean in case Brett decided to beat his ass then and there? Um, did, did Triple H get to the ring right away? Um, I think he was here pretty fast. I'm trying to remember what happened there. That's, pr that's probably what it is. Actually. Yeah, he was, because I remember they were walking to the, uh, they were walking to the back together. Okay. Could you tell me who played, uh, Shawn Michaels' Knights at Survivor Series 93? Uh, was Barry Horowitz, Greg Valentine, and Jeff Gaylord? Yeah. Was Glenn? Okay. Hey, right off the top Either of Jeff or Gaylord or Glenn. Everyone said it was Glenn Jacobs. But Glenn was Jacobs Gaylord. was originally one who's Kane, but he wasn't the one. I don't. But he didn't do it in that match. The muscular guy was Jeff Gaylord, and Terry Funk was supposed to be one of them and get unmasked. And he was actually in Boston, and um, for the Survivor Series, and he flew home the day of the show, without telling anyone. <laughs> you should ask him about that sometime. You know what you should do? I was just thinking about this. You should put up a uh, an archive issue of that uh, first Survivor Series story that you wrote. November 17th? Yeah. Yeah, okay. You should do that. Otherwise, everyone's uh, going to be going to the Wrestling with Shadows website and read the edited version. Yeah. That's close. Plus, if there's one newsletter that will uh, sell newsletters, that's it. That was good. It was a good issue. Yeah. What a week that was. Holy... That... That was so weird because that show went off the air, and I had a whole group of, you know, I had a whole group of friends over because I pretty much knew everything that was going on that week as it was going on, and I knew that there was there was problems, and I also knew what the finish was supposed to be and it went, and wasn't, and um, and I'm going like, that sure looks. Like, first of all, my friends go, you know, that looked really weird, and then somebody called me up right away and just goes. I saw the Don Eagle. God, it was Don Eagle and um, maybe Gorgeous George. I couldn't. I forget who. Don Eagle lost his title in Chicago, and it was the exact same finish with the referee running at fast count, fast counting or double crossing and running. And they were sprinting out of the ring, and going like, when Hebner sprint out of the ring, it's guaranteed this is a double cross. And then all night long, I'm thinking, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Right? Mm -hmm. And then you know, like late at night, you know, you start hearing. Brett punched Vince, I'm thinking, like, what? You know? And and at first when you hear that, you go, no, it's an angle, right? Yeah. Then I started hearing it from some friends of Brett. Actually, not, I wouldn't say close friends of Brett. They were wrestlers who Brett confided in that were he was call, that he called up late that night who he wouldn't work. And they were telling me the whole thing and sending me, you know, for sure this is what it is. And then as the days went on, you know, it was like, that was probably, uh, except for Owen Hart's death, I think that was probably the biggest reaction to any news story that I can remember. Maybe, maybe David Von Erich's death in '84. Mm -hmm. That was a real, that was a real big one. Brody's death in '88 was pretty big. Um, but I mean, as far as like a non-death, uh, that that was it for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, here is a list of guys that Vince Russo got over in WCW. Billy Kidman. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He killed him. Uh, yeah. Chronic? A little bit, but there... I mean, no one's over. Yeah. Jeff Jarrett. He tried. Jeff Jarrett's not over. Scott Steiner. I think he did a good job with, with Scott Steiner. Yeah. Booker T. I'll give him Booker T for sure. Chavo Jr., no. Lash LaRue, no way. David Arquette, okay. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, let's see. Do you see WF giving Benoit and Eddie Guerrero a decent length feud with some real meat to it? Uh, yes, I do, by the way. That's I kind of thought, was. um, I was reading, like, Ross was talking about the, um, the radicals in the Ross report this weekend, and he talked about how, you know, they're building towards something for WrestleMania or something like that. I can't remember the exact term that he used, but I was sitting there and just from reading it, it was like, they're going to do a four way with all the radicals of WrestleMania, which oh. I would prefer Ben Walvers Guerrero, but I kind of think that they may do the other one. I mean, it's a match with all four of them. 
Oh, I don't like that. I guess so. it's it's unique. It's WrestleMania. I would much prefer the singles match, but I just think that's what they're going to do. We've got Jim Cornette on the line. Jim, how are you doing today? Dave, how are you? I'm just fine. Hey, I'm doing really good. I, like, overloaded myself on uh, your commentary between Four Hours of Ohio Valley and Rob Feinstein's tape. <laughs> That well, was my weekend. Well, you you got to take you got to take a breath in between all that. You got to pace yourself. <laughs> go at it, go at it for the long haul. Be a be a marathon runner, not a sprinter. Okay, and you were out there. How long telling those stories? Because I've I've gotten through about maybe an hour or two of the Feinstein tape. Well, you do this two tape set they sent me. Oh, I, well, I I don't even know how long it turned out to be. He just he said I want you to just sit down and tell stories. I said okay. How many days you got? And it was <laughs> the same day. Uh, so I think it's probably four, five, six hours something. <laughs> That was that was that was amazing. One of the things I guess. Uh, what's your take on the Waller thing? Um, I, I knew that was obviously going to be one of the first questions asked. And let, let me make a statement before I answer that on on what you were just talking about while I was on hold. I was listening. Isn't it a shame? And doesn't that show you how gossip oriented and trash TV oriented America has become? When the the you have to uh, think of competing news stories for the Bret Hart Shawn Michaels finish at Survivor Series. The only one you can come up with is somebody dying. Yeah. You know, I mean, good Lord, is there more you know, I was gonna, than who I was gonna, won the match? Okay, you know what? It just reminded me of something, because I was going to ask you this, and I probably would have forgotten this. It was something that I was thinking, being that for, on Friday's show, we got a whole bunch of Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels emails again, after not hearing about that story for a long enough time. Two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is four years ago, almost. You told me a couple of, I don't know, a couple months ago, and, and, and you actually made a really good point. The first person who ever made a good point in this on why you think Shawn Michaels didn't didn't know, as opposed to did know. Oh, and I'm trying to think what I said. And I, well, one of the things that that uh, comes straight off. Aside from that, you didn't think he was good enough actor. I'm sorry. You didn't think he was good enough actor for one. Well, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you you could see it on his face that he wasn't worried about what had happened, except that it, it screwed his matchup because he still had a couple more things to do. But also. Um, I don't think that, that, that he knew about it because I think the first thing he would have done would have been said something to everybody in the place because he wouldn't want the heat to go on him. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, that's the reason why I would think that he didn't know about it because he wouldn't have been able to, to keep his mouth shut about it because people already blamed him, said, you know, Brett's wife or whoever said, oh, you were in on it, you were in on it. Well, no, he wasn't in on it because that's the exact reason. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have told the guy anything either. He would have been able to keep it to himself. Now, the main reason everybody thought that he knew was the fact that, um, what was he, was like looking at the ref and he looked right away when he rang the bell or something like that? I think he was just puzzled. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, and, and, and everybody has seen enough temper tantrums that, that Shawn Michaels has thrown when, when, you know, when somebody doesn't move on the elbow, um, I think to, to see that, that his reaction was very genuine in that case. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, once again, it's it's three or four years ago it was, it was the second. It wasn't even the first. It was the second world title double cross in Montreal in history. So you know, <laughs> I think it's a shame that that has has become the the defining news story of the wrestling business of our age. But uh, as far as the Lawler situation, um, I really, once again, I was not there in Phoenix. I only know what I've read on the internet. As uh, somebody, uh, actually, you know, I don't get on a computer either. Uh, sorry to knock your show, but. The computers are the downfall of modern civilization. However, people have printed stuff out for me because of my interest in this. And I heard uh, what Lawler had to say on his website, and I heard what the WWF had to say on their website. And um, I don't know the whole story, and I don't think the whole story is out there, so I really can't say who was a was a uh, uh, at fault or who was a knucklehead for, for acting the way they did because there's something there that is, that is not being told that, that doesn't meet the eye on, on one or both sides. Because uh, I just I don't uh, I don't see the the sense in in what all happened uh, as it's presented, and I don't know the story. So all I'm you know I I've had people say to me, well, you know, Lawler should have realized that you know it wasn't going to last forever. That his girlfriend is going to have a job. It is a gravy thing. Well, yeah, you know, and I'm sure he, as I know Jerry Lawler, he's smart enough to realize that. So he must have been more offended about the way that it was done than the fact that it was done. However, the way that it was done. Uh, they don't do business like that any other time. As a matter of fact, you know, it's been a joke in some cases. It's awful hard to get fired from the WWF. You really got to screw up really bad. Uh, they've taken care of so many people that have done so many stupid things that uh, I don't know why they would have been so anxious to, you know, remove uh, uh, Cap from their roster. So maybe there's something there. I don't know, so I'm not going to pick a side on this one. How big a blow do you think it is to the company? Um, it's, 
you know, once again, it's a, it's a blow to the to the company, to the people who like Lawler's commentary and his work, and it's a blow that that uh, they have to fill that slot on some of their television shows when they've already got an overworked announce staff in, in Jim Ross, who, you know, let's face it, is their announce staff practically. Um, you know, you're going to have to carry more burden, I would think, having people who are not as experienced as Lawler on the air with him. But, you know, once again, let's face it, Bret Hart left. Ultimate Warriors left. Every every big star in the world has left every promotion in the world at one time or another, and they've gone right along. So it, it's it's a blow in terms of the workload on some people and in terms of the presentation of the show, but it, it, it's not going to... And this is not a knock on Waller. It's not going to mean anything as far as the, as the the revenue of the pay per views or the houses, etc. is concerned, because the WWF now is is big enough, I think, to lose anybody. They lost Austin while he was out uh, with an injury and and chugged right along. I don't, so I don't think any one person is going to adversely affect uh, the WWF in a huge way. And as far, as far as now, one of the one of the candidates that would have been brought up to do that is you. And in fact, I actually talked to some people about that. And it was never even considered because of the feeling that you you would not you would not have wanted that role at all, right? Well, no. I, as a matter of fact, somebody at our television uh, here uh, last week at our OVW TV said, "Are you going to replace Lawler on Raw?" And I said, "No, because we couldn't come to an agreement to have him shoot it every week in Louisville." <laughs> you know, now under those circumstances, I would have hopped on the job. But uh, you know, maybe Indianapolis. I'll go as far as Nashville. Um, you know, but <laughs> I don't believe they were in the. In the uh, frame of mind to renovate their entire booking schedule to shoot raw within a 180 mile radius of Louisville just to get me to co-host the show. So I would uh, I would think that's probably not going to take place. Well, one of the things I want to mention is uh, I was watching a bunch of the Ohio Valley tapes this weekend, and I saw the commentary that you did on the Christmas Chaos match with Nick Dinsmore and Chris Benoit. And I want to make this point, because I already wrote about it, um, and that is that... Um, that match was probably, I mean, I don't know how much of it you showed on TV. It seemed like about five, six minutes. But your commentary and the story that you told, and basically the story was that if Nick Dinsmore were to pin Chris Benoit, it would springboard him onto Raw because he would pin Chris, Chris Benoit. And the whole thing is like, you know, if he wins this match, he's going to be on Raw. It's like his, it's his big break and all this. And then he finally, after all this time, hits the German suplex, and Rico Constantino does a run-in, and it's a DQ finish. And that finish... 99 times out of 100. You know, the, you know, you go a long match, and then just heel interfere DQ. It's like this finish where I'm going to go, oh, God, I watched the match for 15 minutes with this cheap finish. Right. And your commentary made it where that finish had the right kind of heat as opposed to the wrong kind. Because it, it's like, you know, we've seen that finish a million times, and you just groan, but you presented it. And it was the presentation of, of it, and then the presentation of Rico Constantino that, he really screwed that guy, as opposed to, in a way that made you mad, as opposed to in a way that said, "Oh God, I just invested 15 minutes and they couldn't give me a finish." Well, you yeah. know, and and I guess that's a commentary on on you know the business in general these days that that you get commented or you get complimented when you just do something the way you're supposed to do it, um, <laughs> and it's a sad thing, but. That was a great match, and by the way, you said five or six minutes. I think we showed ten, which shows that it was a good match okay. because you didn't feel like you were sitting there watching something for ten minutes. Well, it, 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 I mean, I mean the, the whole point is it was real long, and, and that you know, and, and it was a hell of a match too. And, and you know, and, and I think that's part of it is that that Chris Benoit came in never having having uh, been in the ring with Nick Dinsmore in his life, uh, not knowing anything about the kid, and developed during the time they were in the ring a real respect for him to the point where Benoit was saying to people afterwards that he would love to come back and wrestle Nick Dinsmore again. And Nick Dinsmore, uh, in his hometown, uh, in front of the biggest uh, crowd that OVW has ever drawn, a sellout at the Gardens, with all the pressure on him, defending the OVW title in a, in a marquee match that had been talked about for three months, you know, he had to be just shaking like a dog pooping peach seeds with nerves. But he went out there, and he stayed with Benoit and looked exactly like he belonged in the same ring with the guy. And that was a real compliment to Nick. And they had a great match, and I had a great match to be able to commentate. And... Um, the, the the fact that, that people have seen, you know, quote unquote that finish so many times doesn't negate the, the, the fact that when they see it, when it makes sense, when it's right, when it uh, is presented well and when it's executed by all the parties, it's it, it's that's what should be done. You don't go out there and do something that they've never seen before just for the sake of surprising people because you know what, I've never seen a guy uh, lay down in a ring and and, uh, and and go to sleep and take a nap, but that doesn't mean it'd be exciting. That just means people be going, what the heck do you do that for? How about a one-finger world title switch? Uh, yeah, well, uh, unfortunately, I've seen one of those, but don't expect to see them any, on any card that I'm involved with because I'd hit the ring by the two count. 
But you know, hey, we gotta hit you, don't, you don't, you know, a lot of times people say, "Well, we're really surprised, and they ain't expecting this." Well, you know what? In some cases, you don't need to give them something they're not expecting because there's a reason they're not expecting it because it wouldn't make any sense or it wouldn't draw. Isn't that funny? We usually make that almost those exact same comments about three times a week on this show. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can't be blamed for plagiarism because the only time I hear your show is, is when I'm on it because I don't have a computer. So see, I don't okay, we've well, you know. got a ton of emails here. Hey, uh, Dave, if I could, I'd, I'd like to make one point about what we were just talking about because I'm I'm really so glad that you liked uh, the Dinsmore and, and Benoit match and the commentary and etc. And I think that. Uh, a lot of people, and uh, this is the shameless plug also, we're finishing up the production of the Christmas Chaos uh, Home Video, which we're going to have on our website, obwrestling.com. You can already order it now. But the Chaos event, we tried to have different types of matches. And Dinsmore and Benoit went in the ring and had a classic, old-time, old-style championship match with great uh, great performance on both guys' side. Uh, we had the Monsters match with Kane and Leviathan, had the hardcore match with all the furniture in the ring. And, and what is also on the tape that, that stole the show that we did not air on television that actually surprised a lot of people was Matt and Jeff Hardy and Lita against uh, Payne, Damian, and Sin, which is the match really that stole the show uh, when there were so many candidates. But you saw the, the raw footage of that of the, the whole event and the crowd response. No, I haven't match. seen the raw footage of the event. You have not? I thought I sent it to you. No, 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 you I, didn't. I, I just, I've just, all I've got is TV, is all your TVs. Ah, well, this, the, the sixth person did not air on television, but the, the people thundered through the entire match, and when Jeff Hardy swanton sent through the table, the pop was, was rivaling, if not exceeding, Steve Austin's. And, mm. and so that showed that, that people got into a variety of different kind of matches, and that's what I think is missing also on a lot of shows these days is you give them 18 matches of the same kind, and no matter how good they are, eventually they can't follow one another because it's more of the same. You know, one thing um, that I've really enjoyed on your TV is uh, Rico Constantino. He's fabulous. As a heel. It's kind of a, a mix between R Rick Martell and Kurt Angle is, is kind of how I view it. Um, but uh, he's really, and, I, and he was coming along pretty good as a babyface, but as a heel, you know, he's one of those guys where you know they're doing pretty good as a babyface, and you turn and heel, and it's like, wow, he really he really clicked. Yeah, and, and uh, it, it was about that time, too, and, and, and Rico had had done about as much as he could do in the position that he was in. Uh, I mean, you know, the kid is he's phenomenal. He's a, he's a prodigy as far as learning this business. But now he's able to really go out there and, and show a whole lot more personality than I think uh, he, he was doing before, and he's more comfortable with it. He wouldn't have been ready maybe six months ago to, to be that comfortable and, and be able to do that. But, you know, but now he is, and, and I think it's really helped him. You know, one of the, the big thing that he's got going against him is, is age. I mean, it's like, you know, he's... He's actually, I think, 30, 38, 39 years old, and uh, doesn't look it, but he, but he is. And it's like, you know, if he was 15 years younger, I would go like, you know, this guy's, you know, he's going to he's gonna make it and be a big star. Well, but you know, with him, the time, you know, his time, you know, that's, I think that's one of the reasons why you know, whenever, like you see in the Ross report when they mention guys, his name is not mentioned, and when I look at the show, I mean, he's, he's much farther along than the guys who are mentioned. Oh, yeah, and, and I don't think that anything to do with it, really. I mean, it, it always has a bearing, but you've got to understand that he has not been abusing his body for, for the past 15 years in wrestling. Um, he, is, he has been relatively injury-free, except for the, the knee, which was something that could have happened to anybody. He just, you know, he landed wrong on a flip and tore a quad. But except for that surgery, he's been injury-free, and if you ask somebody that's looking at him in the ring, how old is this guy, they say 28. And uh, nobody, nobody takes into account Stan Lane, when he was in the Midnight Express, uh, tearing a house down every night, was about the same age that, uh, that Rico is now, and he didn't look at either, and nobody brought it up because it, it wasn't a factor. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, think that, uh, I think he's got, because guys now, their careers are shorter um, than, uh, you know, than they used to be because they make more money and also because of the style, but conversely, even if you get in a little bit later, if you have the talent to learn what you're doing, you got a shorter window of time, but you can still make some money. Now, I got a question also for one, one, one of the things is uh, Flash Flanagan. Yes. Uh, at the, uh, uh, the do me a favor, send out a bulletin. Flanagan is dead. Flanagan is gone. His name is Flash. Okay, um, sorry. We still have that that problem. He changed that like a year and a half ago, and and still I actually know that. it is it's hung on. Uh, but anyway, he did that that thing at the uh, I guess it would be at your was it your January show or your February show, uh, where he was that was that a work? What, what what thing? Where he did kind of like a blockbuster move and landed with his head on a chair. Oh, oh the the whip the, flash. Actually, he came down. It, it, he didn't land head first on the chair, but he came down sideways on his shoulder, and 
you know, let's face it, Flash is, is um, I won't say he's injury prone, but he works with injuries constantly. And in this case, the way that he landed, the way that he felt afterwards, he had numbness in his arm, it spooked a lot of people. He was all right afterwards, but it, it was the, the concern was there, at, you know, when it happened. Uh, but, you know, it, it, he shakes things off that, that a lot of other people would have pro trouble with, and he's always at the doctor, but he always gets it up and goes right through it. So he took, um, I want to say, 10 days off, and, and, you know, he was cool after that. Okay. Let's go, let's go to the phone calls. We'll start with PJ in San Francisco. PJ, what's up? Hey, Jim. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Very good. Um, I was watching some old Memphis tapes the other day from, uh, like, 1982. Yes. Um, and I was watching where you, like, debuted in managing. Do you remember that? I guess uh, unfortunately, I thought I'd managed to burn or buy up all the copies of those tapes, but, uh, yes, they still exist. Oh, those tapes are great. You were doing the gimmick where your mom financed your managing career. Right. Yeah, that was great. Um I was wondering where that angle ever led because the last part I have on my tape is where you um you you were out there with Dutch Mantel and you, you said you had him signed up and then he like tore up the he contract tore up the picture. on TV. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, uh, see, I uh, I I managed Dutch for like one week and of course in that week since I was a rookie manager didn't know what I was doing, I managed to get him disqualified in his title match with Lawler. So he uh uh told me to hit the bricks and uh, at that point I began, as one would think, I would desperately searching for people to uh, to try to get even with Dutch Mantel, and that was uh, uh, guys like a Crusher Broomfield, who later became famous not through any of my managerial efforts as the One Man Gang. Uh, Jesse Barr, uh, Adrian Street came in the picture about that time. So I had a, a lot of people uh, chasing after first Dutch Mantel, and then all the rest of the the heroes of Memphis. Uh, how long were you in that territory? Doing that. Uh, for about a year and a half, mostly, uh, give or take about six weeks that I went somewhere else that didn't work out. Okay, and where did you go after that? You went to Georgia or whatever? Um, actually, the, the Georgia was in the middle. Um, okay. We went to Georgia for six weeks, a lot of us, and hardly anybody remembers it, and it would probably bore the listeners to death to tell the story. And then after I uh, remember Memphis, Ter actually, Ter Terry first... Taylor and Bobby Fulton as the original Fantastics, right? Exactly. Dave remembers yeah. it. Yeah. Me, me, Dave, and some wino in Atlanta under the overpass <laughs> remember that. Um, but actually, from Tennessee, uh, my first real territory I went to was Mid-South Wrestling. Uh -huh. And was Memphis your very first uh, exposure on camera? Uh, yes. Business? As a matter of fact, um, I, well, you know, I was from here, and, and uh, at the time didn't really have any plans to go anywhere else. But yeah. um, starving versus an offer of people paying me money I changed my mind. Well, that was some great stuff, despite what you may think looking back on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, uh, another question about the Midnight Express. Do you um, know who did their theme music? Actually, um, the original theme music that we used for quite a while until Crockett started getting into a licensing difficulty with using uh, commercial music uh, was the theme music from the movie The Midnight Express. It came out in 1978, and it was uh, it was an instrumental done by a guy named Giorgio Moroder, who was the producer for all of Donna Summer's disco hits. Uh-huh. Um, and it's on the movie soundtrack, if anybody can find it. Yeah. At a Starcade, I guess it was 87, when you went off the scaffold? Did that you, was 86. Um, I'm for, I remember 86. that one. Okay. Did you basically know that you were going to get hurt, or was there any hope in your mind that you might land the right way? <laughs> 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 you were going to survive that fall. You know, I've never had anybody ask me that question exactly like that. You know, I, I let's put it this way. I I knew that it probably wasn't going to turn out well, but I didn't know how bad it would turn out, or I wouldn't have been stupid enough to do it. Yeah. Um, was that totally your idea to do it, or? Uh, yeah. No, I was I was uh, sold on that one by one of the great car salesmen of our time. <laughs> Dusty Rhodes. American Rose? Dream himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, no, sound, I, you know, it sounded like a good idea there, on paper. I, as I was hanging there, it was running through my mind that there's no way this could turn out really well for me. <laughs> but, uh, I didn't realize the extent of it until I landed. Well, I didn't realize the extent of it until about ten minutes after I landed. Yeah. Then I figured, well, you know, that's probably one of the things that I should not have done in my life. Yeah. Well, it's a great visual for what it's worth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I did it, at least I'm glad it was on video. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's about all I've got. It's good talking to you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, Jim, I, I know this is probably a loaded question, but what are your thoughts on Paul Heyman showing up on Raw tonight? Um, is he going to? Yes. Oh, well, um, hell, sooner or later, even a blind squirrel finds a nut. Um, 
I, I actually I was going to watch Raw just to see who was going to do the show instead of uh, Lawler and 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 how it was going to turn out for Jr. But now that you've warned me, I, I may switch over to uh, well, they don't have Outer Limits Monday on Sci Fi anymore, so I, you know. Um, but you can always watch Nitro. Dinner, and I don't really want to see Paulie's face because I'm afraid it'll give me indigestion. Uh-huh. <laughs> Let's go to Phil in DC. Phil, what's going on? Hey guys, how you doing? Hey. Really uh, good. Jim, I had to actually ask this question to Dave, and he says suggest I ask it to you. I was watching some 1990 WCW television matches, and it was, they, that was the period they brought in Rip Rogers, right, to work as. Oh, like the Rip a, Rogers question, yeah. Enhancement guy. The so Rip was, Rogers question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rip Rogers was, I was, and I was super impressed with how good he was. I mean, he was like one of the top guys on there. He never won a match, but he had a really, really great bunch of matches with Pillman and. Buddy right, and I remember the one with Pillman, where Pillman did the the air Pillman off the balcony, or oh, yeah, the he overhang like or whatever. Breaking his neck. <laughs> yeah, and he had a really great match with Terry Taylor on like NWA New York or something like that. And and I was watching, and it looked like you know Rip Rogers looked to me, and I haven't seen that much of his stuff on tape. It's like the hidden great worker that never ever really got. Anywhere, and I know that you know you work with him. And I guess you still work with him now in Ohio Valley. And why right. do you think he never really became a big star? Well, you know, uh, Rip's work was as good as anybody's at one point, and and uh, he was a phenomenal athlete. And uh, you know, he's, he's right now hampered by you know uh, basically having done this for twenty six years or whatever, and and his knees are, are not the best, and his shoulders bad. But the point is, you know, he would go out there and he could tear the house down with anybody. And that's a time when WCW had. A lot of younger guys, a lot of green guys, a lot of guys that they were paying a lot of money to that were not motivated. And they got a guy like Rip in who didn't have a contract who wanted to go out there and, and steal a show and, and have the best match, and he would. And um, the problem, I think, became is that politically, you know, Rip wasn't the uh, the guy that uh, that they wanted to feature. Uh, not they, they didn't look at, at talent or at ability or whatever. I mean, it's been the same way a lot of places, a lot of times, but... They were looking at, uh, well, we're paying this guy a lot of money, so we got to feature him. And uh, wait a minute, this other guy just, you know, he looks twice as good as the guy we're, we're paying a, a bunch of money to. Heck with him, you know, uh, he, he he basically shot himself in the foot by being overqualified. Uh, oh, but Rip, so uh, in, his, in his career, worked in a variety of different territories for almost every promoter in the in the business. Uh, but he was never able to get the, the national television exposure because the right place and the right time just didn't come up. And when it did, uh, unfortunately, the people making decisions were more qualified for pricing pizza than they were for uh, evaluating wrestling talent. I have a, another quick question. Who do you think was the best overall worker you ever managed, and who was, like, the dirt worst? Um, well, the, the dirt worst is very easy. Does anybody remember the name Mantar? Yes. Oh, yeah. That was a real Mike Alec in the WWF is your bodyguard, right? Yeah, poor Mike. Well, well, wasn't even a body. Actually, I could have took better care of him. Um, <laughs> bodyguard, but uh, we won't even go any further. That God bless him, nice guy. But you know, um, as far as the best, you know, it, it, it's hard to argue against Bobby Eaton. I mean, obviously, I managed uh, a lot of a lot of great talent at one time or another, and I mean, had loose affiliations with guys like Dick Murdoch, who. You know, I mean, all around, Dick Murdoch was one of the ten best workers in the business, and also could cut a heck of a promo, and was, you know, and was, uh, you know, hilarious to be around. So, I mean, you can't obviously put him off the list, but time in, time out, and just for the caliber of what he did and, and how good he was, I don't think you can argue with Bobby Eaton as being the, the best guy overall ever managed. Yeah, I was watching uh, some Best of a Midnight Express table a little while ago, and they had a big mini feud between Bobby Eaton and Dusty Rhodes, like over the U.S. title. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that. Yeah, yeah but it, you know, a lot of times, even though Bobby was in a team, um, and this came up with Dusty, this came up with Flair, it came up with Ricky Morton, guys would want to work with him in singles matches uh, just to be able to, to work with Bobby. And the um, same situation happened... Uh, uh, with Flair, where they did a, a few Sunday main events for the, uh, the the old TBS main event show for the uh, for the NWA title, and uh, you know a couple of different times Bobby would be pulled out into singles just so that they would have a chance to see different matches, and those guys would get a chance to get in the ring and work with him. That was Flair's idea, by the way, to to just get in the ring with Bobby in a single match because so many of the boys had been wanting to see what would happen. Because I remember they won in the Clash, but I don't think I ever saw any of those ones on the main event. I remember being a little disappointed with their Clash match. The um, Clash match that got cut short on time. Yeah, the, the Clash match came after. The Clash match was a couple of years after that, as after uh, Stan and I had already left. And I remember seeing it and remember also saying, hey, you know, how could they give this 13 minutes and come to find out it was supposed to be like 25? And it was a um, three-fall match. That was yeah. the problem. Yeah, yeah but the uh, the two matches on the Sunday main event show I thought were, 
were really good. And when you consider that they're the the first two singles matches that, that Bobby had ever had with Flair, and actually um, one of the first three or four times he'd ever even been in the ring with him, uh, they they clicked right off the bat. Oh, wow, I'm gonna have to start to be search my tape list for that. This one's great. This is from Jason Campbell. Uh, if some of the smaller OVW wrestlers, such as Rob Conway, Nick Dinsmore, or Flash, were not called up to the WF, would you advise them to try to get into WCW? Um, well, first off, I wondered how big he is to call in the smaller guys. Um, they're, they're smaller, but that's like, you know, they're 230 and 240. Uh, well, Conway's 226, but he's got body fat of like 1%. Um, if, if they were not, I, I certainly would have, well, you know, I mean, by the time that we're going to determine whether or not they're going to be called up or not, WCW may not in a, indeed exist. I would always tell somebody to pursue the best career, the best job that they can, they can make, um, but that would be hard advice to have to give anybody unless they have no alternatives because, you know, there's a company that nobody really knows who owns it, if they're going to own it, how long it's going to run or exist or whatever, and... You know, it's not through any hard feelings between myself and prior management at this point. It's just common sense. Um, if that's the only alternative, take it. But if you have any other alternatives or hope to have, why hook yourself up to a sinking ship, you know, when you don't know when it's going to go down? Now, was Jason Lee working with you? Say again now? Jason yeah, what were your thoughts about Jason Lee going to WCW? Um, yes, all bad. <laughs> <laughs> and only, and let, let's be honest, Jason Lee... Actually, he went and did one TV or two TVs the one night and don't know whether he's going back. Um, I have thought uh, for a while that he and Derek King are my favorite tag team in the business, and I think that he has a lot of talent, and I think that his size issue, because now they're you know 195 and 200, uh, that has worked against him, uh, because if he could perform like he can and he weighed 230 or 240, he'd have a deal. Uh, I've been uh, frustrated that I could not get a deal or help him get a deal, Um but the, the problem there is that he didn't inform us that he was going before he went. And that didn't sit good with Danny, who trained him, and it certainly didn't sit good with me, who's booking him. So now Jason is sitting for right now, and, um, you know, we're going to see what happens with that. And he also goes... I would uh, not, I, by the way, I would not have advised him not to go, because he did make a very nice payoff um, for doing what he did, and he also opened up an opportunity for himself to be seen. However... Um, you know, I still adhere to the old business practices of when you work in a territory for somebody, if you're going to do something that's going to be seen or impact that territory or affect the people involved in it in any way, you let the booker know, and he didn't. So that's the mistake that, that he is right now uh, hopefully rethinking his thought processes on. So you're not using, you're not using him right now? Not right now, no. Because um, uh, basically, for one thing, it's hard to use somebody when Danny Davis don't want to look at him. Yeah. And he's the boss. Uh, and he goes, well, why don't you use Rip Rogers more on TV? Uh, well, we, we touched on that a little earlier. Rip uh, has a hand in, in running our shows, the promotion of our shows, and also, uh, you know, working and coaching the classes from time to time. But he has had some injuries catch up with him that, uh, that he has actually had nagging him for quite some time. And, and he's in a position right now where he's not really wanting to wrestle until he gets all the feeling back in his fingers and toes and, is able to get up and out of, in and out of chairs uh, without, you know, considerable effort. So he is uh, resting his body up right now. How is Eric Angel doing? Um, Eric is, is a tremendous athlete. It's too early to tell how he's doing as far as, as what type of worker he's going to be, but he's got a great attitude. He's a good kid. Uh, he's got a great background, and he has taken well to, you know, the basics. I mean, he's only been here two weeks. So he's taken well to the basics, but how many basics can you go through in two weeks? Yeah. Um, I, th I think... Um, if I had to say, I think it would be way optimistic to say that there's two prodigies at that level in the same family. However, um, you know, it's possible, and, and we sincerely hope it is. The, uh, what, how, well, I was going to ask about um, uh, Randy Orton, Bob Orton's uh, son. Right. Uh, he, he's doing tremendous. I think you've seen from the, uh, from the recent television, Randy yeah. is, is putting on some size. He's, uh, he's looking good. He's tanned. He's... He's more comfortable in the ring now. He, he's really got the timing down. Um, I mean, he was a natural to begin with. He just had had like eight matches when he came here. And so he has really been somebody that's, that's, that's sucked up and, and, and made the effort and has really improved. And, I mean, he's still only, I think, 20 years old. So, it's, it's, you know, he's, he's going to be phenomenal because he's getting such a head start. And that, that's the difference in, in guys now and, and, and guys of 15 or 20 years ago. 
The guys now are doing things a lot better athletically, but they don't have time to get the experience uh, before that their body uh, breaks down on them. Well, this kid is starting at the time when all the all the guys used to start, and he's not going to break down before he's able to get that experience. So I, I think he's going to be fabulous. What are your, some of your favorite matches and angles from Memphis, both before and after you became a manager there? So this is even like as a fan growing up. Oh, God. Um, well, you know, almost everything involved Lawler. Uh, so, I mean, right there, uh, you know, that that, uh, that takes the top ten spots. But uh, I always loved Joe LaDuke. I was a big Joe LaDuke fan. And, and the stuff that he did with Lawler and, and the uh, the blood oath with the axe and the, uh, the Tupelo concession stand brawl. You know, stuff that, that still a lot of people have seen. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't have my finger on the pulse these days, so I don't know how many people have been without that, how many people haven't seen stuff like that, because it was so widespread, you know, when it happened and for the first several years of, of you know, people started to trade tapes. But uh, the thing with uh, Lawler and Dundee and Ferris and Latham and Tupelo that uh, that started all the concession stand brawls was, was one of the most memorable things I ever saw. And, and uh, Jimmy Valiant's... Um, uh, interrupting uh, an NWA world title match with Harley Race and Jerry Lawler breaking a bottle over Lawler's head. Uh, you know, all that stuff stood out at that time because it was not, every show didn't have seven segments and seven angles. So you had a chance to, to remember stuff. Not only was it well done, but it was also presented as, as an earth-shaking occurrence rather than as something that just happened right before you went to the break. And that's kind of, you know, even though we have to keep the pace up here now, um, that's still what we try to do for, for, for the things that are really important. We try to, like you were talking about with Dinsmore and, and Benoit, we try to place importance on them so that people will remember them and it'll stick. Because a lot of that memorable stuff would have never, would have never been retained by people if, if it wasn't followed up afterwards and, and talked about like it was a big deal. I don't think that the stuff now, even though there's a, a lot of people who watch wrestling now, I think that like a lot of the personalities will get over, but as far as individual angles, I think it's tougher because back then, you know, you, you, know, the, the, you know, the big angle, I mean, I remember the big angles from 20 years ago better than the angles from two weeks ago because 20 years ago I saw one every couple months, and two weeks ago I saw 14 that night. You know right. what I mean? and, and, you know, I think, I think there's a, a middle ground that you've got to go to, and you've got to stay there where you don't, you don't present so little that people get bored waiting for something to happen, but you don't present so much that they can't retain what they've seen. I think yeah, that's, that's the key a, right there. Is, problem. I think a lot of people have passed that by. I think that that's a, the real key one because to me, to me, my test of, a, of an angle is, is when the show is over, if I don't immediately remember all the details of an angle, then I know the angle didn't get over because I'm watching it close and I know that people who are watching it while they're vacuuming or while they're playing with their dog or while they're talking to their kids, if they're not watching with the same concentration I am. And if I don't remember the angle, I know that they didn't either. Yeah, exactly. And, and all the great angles down through history, if you go back and you watch them, now uh, you've been desensitized by seeing things that are more daring or more dangerous or more obscene or more vulgar or more whatever. So it doesn't re it doesn't impact you like it did when you originally saw it. But when you think about it uh, and you go back, you can you you without going back and watching the tape, you always think it was worse in your mind or it was it was more horrifying or the injury was worse or the bump was bigger uh, because that's the way it it, it impacted you. At the time. I remember when. Uh, the, the famous match in the Omni, where, where uh, Ole Anderson turned on Dusty Rhodes. My That's God, they had a riot that angles. night. You know, it took them 45 minutes to get the uh, to get the heels out of the out of the uh, ring and out of the arena, and uh, the people were trying to climb the cage. And it wasn't anything that you don't see every Monday night these days, but it just it was the personalities involved and the way it was presented and the time it took to build it up. Well, it's I think like a lot the... of things 20 years from now that are going to be remembered are. Like, half of them are things that really weren't planned, like, you know, Montreal Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels. and yeah. Bret Hart swearing in that cage match because they thought it was off the air or whatever the deal was. Or yeah. just, like, the really horrible angles, like Big Show falling off the building. or <laughs> <laughs> David, David, Ar David Arquette, David Arquette David winning Arquette. the world title. Yeah, well, right, right, right off the bat, you can dismiss any angle that people don't believe. Yeah. Because then they're not going to remember because they're not going to care. And see, that's why the people remember the old time angles because they believed it. First and foremost, you didn't need to set up, you know, their, their suspicion of disbelief. It was already there. And then they saw it and wow. Now the things they remember are the Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, the things that were unplanned, that didn't, weren't supposed to happen, that were really a shoot, or they remember the things that they thought were shoots, but were really not, and they can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what they remembered in 1979. They remember the same thing 
22 years later, but you just have to plan a little harder and execute a little better. Now, one thing uh, when you were talking about things that, that um, 20, you know, when you look back, won't you know look you know won't look as bad. One thing, 20 years from now, when people look back at that tape, that will look just as bad as it did a few weeks ago was uh, Sid's broken leg. I have not seen that yet, but I'm, I've talked to a couple people that have, and yeah, they said it, it looked like uh, Feisman sprained his ankle compared to to this, and I'm not sure I'm really anxious to see that. Yeah, that's the one that'll that'll hold up for a hundred years. But you know, he's the only one. He's been in the business fifteen years. He tries to come off the top rope one time and cripples himself. This is uh. It was the middle rope. Oh my God! I thought it was the top. It was the uh, middle. That's even worse. I didn't think it was but it was the middle rope. I think middle my mother should come kick. off the middle rope. They they thought he was trying to be Jumbo Saruta. He's not. <laughs> uh, let's see. This is uh. Are you are you have any interest in running uh, OVW in Indianapolis? Um, we have a television outlet in Indianapolis. Uh, it's a it's a low power station, but it has a lot of cable coverage. Um, but you know, Indianapolis is a market that's been uh, both burned in the past by uh, by local wrestling organizations, and is also is a pretty major market in terms of expense and and uh, you know what it would take to really promote on a on a major level there. So I'm not going to rule it out for in the future, but there aren't any immediate plans. Okay, let's see. This is uh, of these three angles. Of these three, which was your favorite? The angle where you turn on the dynamic dudes. Now that I remember, that was one of my favorite. The angle with uh, with Paul Lee with the original Midnight Express, and then the other one was uh, when you showed up at the ECW arena. Well, um, my favorite one of the three. Um, the, I like to deal with the dudes, but at the time we were looking at it as nothing more than than something to do. Um, but a lot of people remembered it because it was one of the first. Uh, on one of the the first, not the first, but one of the first clashes, and a lot of people saw it, and also because they were so sick of the dudes at that point, because they were such offensive baby faces, uh, with the skateboards and the you know the weird hats and etc. They just loved seeing us uh, whack them. Um, the thing with Paul Lee was my favorite because of everybody's performance involved. Uh, it didn't draw any money because that was at the time of the the sale to TBS and. A they lot of things it. happened, and it never drew a dime, but it was, you know, it was a great angle, and everybody performed well. And the thing in the ECW arena wouldn't even make my top 15 list just because the only people that were really um, impacted by it were the people there in the arena were surprised to see me. Um, we never followed it up. It, I never came back. Um, there was never any, you know, anything made of it to sell tickets. It was just, and that's the way it was presented as such at the beginning. They just wanted a surprise. Well, by gum, they were all surprised. But uh, that's, you know, it was a nice night. That's about as far as it went. This is from Scott Foy. He goes, hypothetical question. You're on a canoe trip. Well, first of all, this will never happen. Well, I was about to say, right, right there we've gone off into fashion. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. no, no. On a canoe okay. trip. First of all, he's not going to be on a canoe trip. Second of all, the, the other pe people in the canoe are Paul Heyman, Vince Russo, Phil Mushnick, Eric Bischoff, and Jim Hurd. Oh, my God. So that's a canoe trip. Now, give me first a of all, we got, we got Russo, Bischoff, Hurd, Paul Lee. Phil Mushnick. Phil, Phil Mushnick and, and Paulie and myself. Okay, in okay. Canoes. so okay, so this is the canoe capsizes. Well, first of all, Jim's trying to put Mark Madden in there. Put Madden well, Mark in there. Oh, in there too. I just thought some Madden wouldn't fit in a canoe. He'd need a steamship. Okay. But, uh, I think you ought to put that on pay per view. Okay, so anyway, the canoe capsizes. You can only rescue one of them, but you have to rescue one of them. So who is it? Okay, I can only rescue one when the canoe. And, capsizes. and, and you have to rescue one. But you I can't just say I just one. But you have to rescue one. I pull Russo out because if I seriously, if the canoe capsizes, all those people are, are are drowning. I'm the only one that can swim. I got to rescue one. I pull Russo to the bank. Then there's no witnesses to what I do to him from there. <laughs> and he's the only one that I really hate enough to not just want to sit there and see drowns. I actually risk my life to pull this carcass out of the water so that I can stick my thumb in his eye. Oh my God! Let's go to Craig in Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. That was not the answer I was expecting. Craig, what's going on? Hello. Craig. Come in, Craig. Hello? Hello? Speak up. Craig, what's up? Jim Cornette. Yes, sir. What if... See, uh... See, 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 see. Let's go to Todd in New York. Todd, what's up? Hey, what's up? You guys coordinated that joke on the canoe, didn't you? No, someone sent it. Scott Foy sent it in, and I was just reading it. That was the first I saw of it, too. That's, that's the I first reading. I heard of it, but I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea now, to tell you the truth. Hey, how are you guys doing today? Doing good. That's good. Um, I, I, first, I just wanted to pass along. I, I got some OV tapes, uh, OVW tapes recently, and I was struck by the exact same thing you were, Dave, and that 
it, it, it was something that uh, made me remember why I enjoyed Smoky Mountain Wrestling so much because they actually like told the story and, and the same thing with Ohio Valley Wrestling now they actually told the story in every match so that if you just watched a match you didn't have to watch you know five hours of television to enjoy that match in itself and that that really sort of resonated with me. Um, I had a couple questions for Jim. Um, the first one, in terms of um, WWF now, um, with Heyman coming in um, as his announcer or whatever he's going to do, um, it's sort of an interesting dichotomy where you have all these guys who once were, you know, sort of enemies of WWF all under the same umbrella. What with, you know, Heyman and JR, even yourself, Jim, um, with, you know, with the Ohio Valley Wrestling, where all the enemies have sort of ended up in the same place. And I was wondering what all you guys think is, whether that's going to cause any sort of problems, because it's very different. But there's, it's a very different setting when you mix a bunch of different wrestling minds as opposed to mixing a bunch of different wrestlers. And now you've got all these different people with different backgrounds and different ambitions, and they're all sort of in the same boat, so to speak. Well, I think that it that it's, it's makes for, uh, obviously, an interesting uh, catering room uh, at the tapings. Um, but, you know, the thing is, and this is what everybody's got to understand, and, and, and hopefully they're starting to now, the reason why the WWF has continued to flourish and the reason why everybody else hasn't is because it doesn't matter whether everybody's on the same page. It just matters whether the guy at the top's on the same page. And Vince McMahon is always going to be uh, where Vince McMahon wants to be, whether whether people like that or not or whether they, they, they agree with his opinion or not. And, of course, everybody knows Vince McMahon's idea of wrestling and my idea of wrestling is very separate, but at the same point, he runs the company, the buck stops there, anybody who doesn't want to do within his framework what they can for the company gets booted. And uh, either that or find someplace else to go and, you know, take somebody's money like Russo did. Um, so if Paulie and Jim Ross and myself and, uh, you know, let's pick three or four more names and throw them in there, if we all don't agree with each other as people, well, that's fine. And I'm sure that if, you know, if it came to it, Vince would like to sit down and watch several of us, you know, swing at each other. But... What, as long as we're working for him, we've got to do what we believe is the right thing for the WWF, and, and that all goes through the editor, which is Vince McMahon. So as far as the power struggles in WCW where Hogan wants this and Piper wants that and Bishop wants that, that ain't going to happen because Vince has the power and he will give other people authority, but ultimately there can be no power struggle because the only person Vince would be able to choke would be himself. And that's why you've always got to have one guy at the top. That's why it's successful. Do you think there might be some, uh, well, this is all you guys, do you think there might be some sort of explosion similar to what might have happened to get, you know, Lawler out uh, that might happen between sort of the under people as they're sort of struggling to get Vince to go in a certain direction? Because there's sort of a lot of different directions. Well, you know, once the, see, I, I don't think there was anything like that with the, the Lawler situation at all. Um, you know, it wasn't about the direction of the company or whatever. It was, it was a talent relations issue between, you know, Jerry himself, uh, his, his wife, and, and the company which is totally different than what you would have if you had, you know, Jim Ross trying to do one style and Paulie trying to do another style and, and uh, you know, Bruce Pritchard over there trying to do something else. You know, in the end, Vince is going gonna, is gonna to be the one to decide. And Vince was willing to go with uh, Vince Russo for a while, but he didn't go with everything. We saw what happens when Russo go, goes with everything that he wants to do on WCW. It's not a pretty sight. Um, you know, Vince will go as far as he wants to go with something, as far as he thinks it's successful, and then he's going to be the guy to say, well, you know what, maybe we better back up or turn left, and if those people don't go, then they can't go along for the ride. i got another random question sort of on this sort of theme. Like, it was just striking me. I was, we were, Dave and Brian were talking about how um, everyone at WWF ends up getting humiliated at one point or another, whether it's you or Jim Ross or Kevin Kelly or, you know, everyone throughout their history, Finkel. And I was thinking the one guy they never humiliated was Gorilla Monsoon, who always had this very dignified announcer position, then the dignified commissioner, and then sort of the elder statesman at the end. And I was wondering if you had any insight as to why that was. Well, I, you know, and, and everybody says humiliated, and, and God bless him with Howard Finkel on occasion that has been the case. But, but you know, at the same time, Finkel's the longest-running employee in the company, and, and everybody likes Fink. Um, it's not a humiliating. It's it's It's... Entertainment. It's the manager getting the take yeah. of the face. I don't know if the, is, Kevin Kelly had, his, had picked his nose on the air a couple of weeks ago. Well, now, I'm not saying it's always good entertainment. I, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying that everybody always has the greatest idea. I didn't see that per, you know, particular thing. But, you know, I don't believe that they ever humiliated uh, me with anything I did because, you know, like the time where I was uh, backstage, I can't remember what, and Vince is in the wheelchair, and Vince, the door opens, I'll throw the door open and whack Vince. 
now I get the opportunity to, to do my old, uh, you know, heel manager thing, or what, 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 humming, 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 I'm sorry, boss, you know, and he gets the chance to yell at me and send me running off, and it was a, a piece of business and a break. Um, you know, that, that's, that's, that's part of the show, and it can't all be death and destruction and famine and pestilence and plague, but, you know, unfortunately, that's why that, that we do wrestling instead of Saturday Night Live, because there's a lot better wrestling writers in the WWF than there is comedy writers, so sometimes the comedy don't, mm-hmm. don't go too well, but Gorilla was never in a position to do something like that because it just wouldn't have worked. Gorilla didn't have the personality, didn't have the demeanor. You know, he's a huge guy. He was a great ex-wrestler. You know, he was well fed. You know, you don't want to see that guy wearing a, a, a tutu. Um, but, you know, for, for Harvey Whippleman, yeah, you know, stick his face to cake. What the heck? Well, I mean, even like Jim Ross, though, I mean, no one wanted to see Jim Ross as the crazy poster worker. Um, we'll see, once again, and everybody knew that. Russo. Everybody that knew Russo. that Vince Russo. See, Russo didn't care. That was one of the things. Russo didn't care whether it was what the people wanted to see or not. Russo wanted to make a buffoon of Jim Ross because Jim Ross was the one likely to be able to tell Vince that Russo was full of crap. Um, so he wanted to diminish his standing in every way he could, and it was a personal, uh, a personal thing that was taken too far that was put on the air. And Russo would have would have hammered it until the dogs came home, but um, everybody, including Vince McMahon, saw that no, the people aren't accepting Jim Ross as a crazy heel. They still respect him. They know he's good at what he does. So we're not going to go on with this. And it became a race from history. Okay, that was, that was something uh, that Russo uh, sold as an angle, but in actuality was doing on his own personal time to make Jim Ross look like a buffoon. Guess what? Didn't work. You're know, the first time. I, thought I was listening to Art Bell. The first time that I heard that song on a wrestling show, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, was that Randy Savage's entrance music in, no, in uh, I, actually, ICW? Not really, but kind of, sort of. That was the opening theme music for the, the ICW opening theme of the, of, of the old ICW TV. Because I remember that song, like, even though I, I remember the, when I hear that song, and I remember the movie Midnight Express from many, many years ago, and I remember, you know, your Midnight Express, what flashed into my head was Randy Savage, like, 25 years ago, or quite, wasn't quite that long ago, about 22, 23 years ago, yeah. when I was and and uh, doing all those crazy things, what I'm watching on TV, going like, how does he do that? Because I never saw a do that stuff in those days. Um, you know, and, and this is something that nobody wants to know, but I'll say it anyway, but I'll try to be brief. The movie came out in 78, and the ICW television show, show started production in 79, and they were using that. It was fairly new at the time, and, and then... Um, the Midnight Express of Dennis Condry, Randy Rose, and Norvell Austin, the original version, used the old BT Express, Here Comes the Express disco song. And when Bobby Eaton and Dennis Condry and I got together in Louisiana, um, they asked me, well, let's find some music. And I said, how about we not use the disco of, of the BT Express song and let's use this because I was a fan of the movie and the ICW television show. And that's how it <laughs> stuck. And now that to this day, whenever anybody wants to get a... a Pickle out of me, they'll play that song. Any, any, now, I don't know if you have the time for this, but uh, we've had a couple of emails on this one already. Any interest in writing a book? Um, you know, I just just talking to Scott Peel um, last week, and Scott had suggested, hey, you ought to do that. Uh, you know, I write a book every week when I write on television. Um, I, <laughs> I would like to, which it would be an endless rambling series of old stories that maybe somebody could collate into some type of readable form, but... You know, I, I don't have time because I'm still doing, you know, kind of what I'm doing here, and and I, I don't think I would have time to do justice to it. So I, there's still there's still Smoky Mountain Wrestling videotapes I'd like to produce. Heaven's sake, I haven't done that yet. Hey, uh, well, so tell us everybody about about Brock Lesnar and Sheldon Benjamin because we hear about those names all the time. Oh uh, well, uh, you know, once again, um, they are two guys who are going to be phenomenal, and they're great as a team uh, because they each have strengths and they each have a couple of weaknesses. Shelton is probably one of the most natural athletes and natural wrestlers that, that Danny Davis has ever uh, trained or that I've ever seen. Uh, he picks up on things one or two. I mean, Bobby Eaton came up for a special class a uh, week before last and showed Shelton his knee drop off the top, and, and Shelton was doing it pretty well on a crash dummy uh, after two tries. Uh, I'm not saying I'd want to be the human being to lay there until he, you know, really nails it perfect, but um, <laughs> Shelton is a great wrestler, natural wrestler, and picks things up. Brock, on the other hand, has not been training as long as Shelton. He came in later, but he has the look, he has the size, and he has the person, the, the charisma just to look at him. And also, at 300 pounds and hard as a rock, 
the guy did a shooting star press at the gardens, which blew the roof off the place. Um, he is he is greener in terms of his his execution than Shelton is, but he has so much fire that you know they both they pick each other up, and they're going to be a great tag team here for us in OVW. They already are; they're the Southern Tag Team Champions, and I think eventually one or both will be in their own spot in the WWF. They they've they've both really really been been great guys to work with. Is there a viewer? Is there any, is there any new after since Eric Angel came in? Anybody else new that's come in? Up? No, who, who's the Danucci guy? Um, actually, the the poor kid's name, as I later found out, is Danny Delucci. Uh, he's a friend of Bobby uh, Eaton's from North Carolina that came over to spend some time in Memphis with him, and he rode up with uh, Bobby Eaton and Randy Hales to come to our television taping. Randy uh, gave me the the name wrong, and uh, so I wrote it down that way. And actually, when I found out that that wasn't really his name, I said, "Heck, let's go with Delucci anyway," because it gave me a chance to say Brian Hildebrand's name on my TV show. <laughs> I said that. You know, I wonder if Danny Danucci is the grandson of the legendary Don Danucci that trained great pro wrestlers like Cactus Jack, Brian Hildebrand, and Troy Orndorff. What? Why did you say Troy Orndorff? <laughs> just because. Yeah, do you remember who Troy Orndorff was? Oh yeah, of course, it's Shane Douglas. Yeah, well, I just I just liked saying that name too. <laughs> it, was just, it was a rib. It was just a chance for me to say some. Oh, I knew, who, I knew, I knew it was, but. Uh... <laughs> so, Let's go to Christian. He was just, Danny was just in for for the one time right now. Although he he's a he's a good young kid too, and I wouldn't mind seeing him back. Let's go to Chris in New Jersey. Chris, what's going on? Hey, Dave, how you doing? Doing great. Um, I have a question for Jim. Um, you used to have the Smoky Mountain Fan Weeks back when you ran Smoky Mountain. I was just wondering if there was ever any chance of you doing something like that in OVW. Um, right now, because of the way that our schedule and our territory is laid out, see, in Smoky Mountain, we had, uh, you know, we had, uh, we could have big events on three or four, uh, consecutive days, like Johnson City, Knoxville, uh, Barberville, Kentucky, or over, you know, wherever it may be, and really put together a heck of a week for the fans. Right now, we just run the, the Metropolitan Louisville area, and, we, you know, if we have a garden show, generally, all focus is on that because our, our talent pool as a whole is a little bit less experienced, and I want them to focus on the big show or focus on television. So right now we don't have a string of events in a row that we could put together that, to keep the people busy, but I'd like to probably, I would say within the next, uh, you know, before wintertime, I'd like to do a special weekend, maybe even something this summer. And then once again, a lot of our Louisville Gardens, uh, the big events uh, there are on weekdays because the WWF crew is busy on weekends. So no, it's no. just it's scheduling right now, but I'd like to do some kind of get together, uh, maybe even for a weekend for the folks, uh, if we can put it on the schedule. Oh. Now, as, as far as Louisville goes, when's when's the next show in Louisville, and do you have like any people that are confirmed uh, coming in for that one? Um, well, obviously we we have a, a show every week in Louisville. Um, you no, know, I mean uh, the, the, the next big show, the garden show, too, but the next yeah, show, the gardens show. event. Uh, will be Wednesday night, April the 4th, and it's going to be a good card. Um, uh, talking to some people right now, we probably have one or two WWF names, but we are shooting for another big show such as Rock and Rumble and Christmas Chaos is going to take place in late June, and that will be co-promoted with the uh, uh, 100.5 The Fox here, the, the big radio station coverage, and have uh, some major WWF names on it. We're going to try to uh, either sell out the gardens or, heck, uh, maybe even go to a bigger place. You never know. Really? Uh, there, there's a, there's another uh, another venue that we have had tentative talks at looking at, and um, it's not as well known as to, in terms of uh, location as the gardens and in terms of the wrestling history, but it seats a few more people, and uh, we might have to do that if, if what I've got planned for June comes off because we filled up the gardens with what we had for January. So you really you really got some plans then? Um, well, you know me, Dave. I gotta I gotta stress on stuff. I gotta think about stuff, or else I'm not happy. <laughs> when, I, when I first came to OVW, I said that we would do, do our first, and it's the same way I, I approached Knoxville, and I was off on my time in Knoxville, unfortunately, to the latter, but I've been off on my schedule here to the to the good. I said that we would do our first $20,000 house in a year, and we would sell out the gardens in two years. Well, we did our, our first $30,000 house in a year, and we sold out the gardens in a year and a half. So well, I'm, you also I'm had Steve Austin. schedule so far. You also had Steve Austin. Um, it, well, I, we sold it. I didn't say we weren't going to have to have a draw to sell it out. But we sold it out. <laughs> I mean, if you had Steve Austin, if you had uh, a Steve Austin, if there was a Steve Austin, you had him in Knoxville, you probably would have beaten your time frame. But you, you, know, you know what? Here's the thing in Knoxville, and God bless all these folks, but we brought in Rick and Scott, Scott Steiner. We brought in the big boss man when he was pretty hot in the WWF. Steiners had just been the WWF Tag Team Champions. We had the Funk Brothers. 
Um, I could go on with a list. Road Warrior Hawk and and the the biggest house of the first year and nine months of our existence was me against Bob Armstrong in a lumberjack match. We beat the Steiners by ten thousand dollars in the same building. So but, 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 it was a whole but, different type of animal. But none of them none of them were Steve Austin. Oh sure, no, I'm yeah. not saying that. You know, I'm I'm saying that. You have to go with what's hot, and you have to go with what the, the particular territory will buy. And this used to be the same kind of territory here. I remember one time in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, when uh, Jerry Jarrett was promoting and doing six or 7,000, sometimes 8,000 people every show in Lexington. Uh, he brought in um, uh, Nick Bockwinkle to defend the AWA title against Jerry Lawler and superstar Billy Graham to defend the CWA title against Bill Dundee and drew 5,000 people. Came back the next month with Jerry Lawler against Jackie Fargo in the main event and drew 8,000. They didn't want to see the stars. They wanted to see the issue. Well, now they want to see stars. But uh, five years ago in Knoxville or 20 years ago here, they want to see issues. You have to you have to make sure you keep a pulse on that because you can break yourself bringing in stars if they want to see issues, and you can go bankrupt trying to get in issues if they want to see stars. You know, there's something that's really interesting. This, when we brought up Lexington, now were you... I'm trying to get the time right. You would have been for sure. Okay, now you, you probably would have been in Mid-South when when Savage came back, you know, and, and, and they settled their feud. Were you in Mid-South? I, I was in South at the time. Okay, because, but but you were in you were in the Memphis Territory when the feud was going on, right? Oh, yeah, it was a four-year build. Yeah. See, uh, basically what happened was uh, Randy Savage, obviously, was the son of Angelo Poffo, so was Leap and Lanny Poffo. Um, they, for a number of reasons, for disputes they had with promoters, etc., were basically unemployable in the wrestling business. And nobody wanted to book these guys, and especially nobody wanted to book um, Randy because he was a great talent. He could go out and get over better than most people, but he was also unpredictable, and, and you know, you never knew what they were going to do. So they joined up when uh, Bob Orton Jr., Ronnie Garvin, Professor Boris Malenko, Bob Roop, and a couple other people split off from the Fullers in Knoxville and started their own promotion. The Poffos joined with them, and all of a sudden you had an independent promotion that was being run on a shoestring that was drawing decent spot show crowds in the hills of eastern Kentucky and the wilds of West Virginia that had like one of the greatest array of, of workers on their talent roster that anybody had ever seen. But they were all people who were... Basically, I don't want to use the term blackballed, but basically nobody wanted to use them because of their unreliability, the fact they'd run opposition, or they walked out, you know, whatever the case may be. And and so for a while they uh, they had a tremendous crew of talent, but they couldn't make it go because the you know the business uh, heads weren't, you know, the promotion wasn't in the right frame. The the workers were tremendous in the ring, but you know they they weren't right business wise. So at any rate, people slowly started trickling away. Bob Orton Jr. had another great run in Louisiana and then went to the WWF, blah, blah, blah. But uh, the they always challenged Jarrett and all of his top guys, which were Jerry Lawler, Bill Dundee, you know, et cetera. And um, finally, after four years when ICW was about to go out of business and everybody had left except the Poffos, they made the phone call, made a deal, got back together because business is business, and Randy Savage and Jerry Lawler main evented every town in Jarrett's territory and did huge houses especially in Lexington, because the, the television had been running there for four years with Savage saying he'd kill Lawler if he ever got hold of him. You know, the one thing, that because Lance Russell was on the show, and he was mentioning that they went up there, uh, him and Dave Brown, I think, went up to a, a Lexington trip, and this is when the feud was probably at its hottest, and he was talking about how the wrestlers were, carry, were carrying guns. Oh, oh, well, no doubt about it. I mean, you know, the... Uh, uh, the ICW guys would be in the parking lot behind Rep Arena. Sometimes they'd buy ringside tickets until uh, they smartened up to that and management got them thrown out. Um, uh, and, of course, there was a time where, where Savage uh, waylaid Bill Dundee in the parking lot of a gym in Nashville. Um, he had one of the girl wrestlers, and I won't call anybody's name because I can't remember who it was, but sit outside and watch. And when Dundee came out, Savage and a couple other of the ICW guys came up to him, and Dundee saw him coming. He was outnumbered, tried to get in his car to get in his bag, but they caught him before he uh, could get in there and uh, nailed him with some nuts and broke his jaw. So Dundee was out for about three months because he had to have some type of surgery on the, the jawline fracture. Um, it was a, yeah, it was a serious deal. Uh, let's see. That's let's the way business was back then. It was fun. Let's go to Star in Seattle. Star, what's going on? Hey, Jim. Hello, how are you? Good. Um, me and my boyfriend last night were watching your uh, fan week videotapes from 94 and 95. Yes. And, uh, 
They're really great. Um, I was wondering if you got a chance to beat the living shit out of Mark Madden. No, actually, I never have. And actually, I also didn't know you could say that word on Dave's show, but if you can, he is a shithead. <laughs> and, uh, you know, actually, I wouldn't try to do that because beating the shit out of him, I'll say it again, would take all day. I'd rather beat his brains out because that would only be a two-minute job. <laughs> but, no, unfortunately, I've, the only time that I've ever been in the same building with him since then was at uh, uh, the uh, tribute show that they did for Brian Hildebrand in his hometown uh, shortly before he passed away. And I didn't know that Madden was even going to be there until the night before. And there were discussions as to whether I should go home because I didn't want to cause an incident. Um, and finally, they agreed to keep him upstairs, and I agreed to stay downstairs, and never the twain met, and that wasn't the uh, that was not the venue for it. But at any other point, if I was ever in the same building, I don't care whether he's got a lawyer or not. He can sue me. He can stand in line. I will, uh, if I ever get the chance to see him, uh, do my dead level best to beat the snot out of him. Yeah, right. Um, do you still <laughs> go to Dairy Queen? Um, yeah, there's Dairy Queen right down the street, and you know what? They get my order right every time. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, though. That was great. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been thinking, so many people have asked about the Dairy Queen thing. I'm thinking we should sell that tape on the website. I could probably make more money than selling the OVW television shows. Right. Now, is, that, is, that, is that the one with Lance Storm and everybody? Um, well, actually, it was... Uh, uh, oh, it was the J.R. Benson one, right? Show. Yeah, J.R. Benson shot it. It yeah. was me, J.R. Yeah, Benson, Ron Hill, Chris Jericho, Brian Hildebrand... Jimmy Del Rey and a couple of other people in a van coming back from a show one night. And the show hadn't done real well, so I was a little testy anyway. But um, <laughs> and then yeah, you know, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll put that on the website. I can, uh, I can have the exclusive copyright on that. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, me and my boyfriend think you're, like, one of the greatest men to walk in wrestling. We have a lot of respect for you and what you do. So. Well, thank you very much, Star. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, what's the name of the man that does this interview? Me? Dave Meltzer. Oh, sorry. I always forget the name of people who suck. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Let's go to, let's go to Tom. Tom, what's up? You ain't going to rerun this show, are you, Dave? Uh, this Dave. is the archives, like uh, The Disciple of Sin. Yeah, that that's right. one of Dave's favorite shows. <laughs> Dave, I'd like an exception to what she just said. I'm a big fan of yours. Oh, that's okay. That's so fine. you're the one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you were talking about Macho Man's music earlier before I recall it. I think it was Fame back in the early days of Memphis. He came um, out to Fame. Actually, the, 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 the ICW ICW came out to Fame. You also, now that you've come to yeah, mention it, yeah, uh, it's your yeah. Question for you, Mr. Cornett. Yes, sir. Um, your opinion on the um, stories behind what happened between Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart back in Montreal and Survivor Series. Do you, who do you believe? Do you believe Shawn Michaels had nothing to do with the incident? Do you think he's hiding something? <laughs> Well, we just, I think we did a, a part of a whole show on this one time before, but we talked about it at the top of the program. And, I, you know, I don't think it's, it's worth going through a bunch yet, but to answer your question, no, Sean obviously, clearly, to anybody that knows him, did not have any knowledge of what was going to go on before he went in the ring. Okay. And also, I just heard you mention Jimmy Del Rey. Where is he today? Uh, Jimmy still lives in Florida. He does some managing for uh, for some local promotions down there. He, um, you know, he had been in the, in the wrestling business for quite a while before he became a heavenly body, and he had some injuries stack up on him, and he has had, uh, um, I don't want to say replacements on everything, but he's had hip surgery, which I think he did have a hip replacement. He it was a knee, but he's had surgery on his knee, his hip, his shoulder, and um, the last time that I saw him was at, at Brian Hildebrand's um, uh, wake the night before his funeral, and, you know, he was using a cane at that point. Uh, he is still involved, as I said, managing and, and around wrestling, but... Um, the injury stacked up on him to the point where he's not in the ring anymore, and that's a shame because he was he was really a good performer. Great performer. I love the Heavenly Bodies tag team. Um, another uh, blast from the past, or really not so much so the past, but Mark Merrill, where, whatever, what, who did he piss off? I thought he was a great talent. I thought uh, coming to WWF, winning the IC belt, I didn't think they gave him a fair shake, and then when he came back with that boxing gimmick, they sort of toned down his uh, wrestling. Well, and I, he heard, I he, thought he, they he, killed him. What happened? The worst thing was his selection of great me. partners. Um, yeah. You know, basically his wife overshadowed him uh, as, as basically I saw it coming, to be honest, you know, when they first put him together because he wants to look at him when they can look at her. And then once that uh, Vince was able somehow, this is why I think that Vince is the reincarnation of Merlin the Magician, he was able to take her and get her over despite her lack of any discernible talent whatsoever. 
uh, Merrill became the guy that uh, carried her bag around and was called Mr. Sable. And, um, you know, once that his 120-pound wife power bombed him on live pay-per-view, that was about the end of Mark Merrill. That was the end. Uh, but that was, you know, hey, the family made money, you know, but you were, uh, at the close. Do you remember when, 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 that, when, that, when that happened, we all said that was the end, and I remember Vince Russo writing this thing about how, oh, you know, it's the beginning, and we're going to turn him around, and we're going to do this and this, and Mark Merrill, you know, is, is going to be a bigger star than ever because he took that power bomb and... Yeah, they turned him around all right and turned him out the door. And the, the fan, and it was by demand of the fans because, I mean, you know, I'm sorry, but you can't insult people's intelligence. And how are they going to buy anybody being a threat to Steve Austin or, for that matter, the Brooklyn Brawler if their 120-pound totally inept physically wife can power bomb them um, on national television? That's pretty well a sign that you need to go home and collect stamps. And that killed him so bad he couldn't even go to WCW? Um why, he would go if he wanted to. A, why would they want him? And B, why would why would he want them? She made so much money off of standing around, you know, showing off her surgeries that uh, I don't think they need to work. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Just gentlemen. being honest. Of course, I try yeah, to we, sugarcoat things, but you know. We we uh, we uh, what was it? Uh, I, was it independent that we heard um, that that um, what's his name? Um, Earthquake was doing. Oh yeah. Tenta. It was. Uh, yeah, we heard that Mark and Rena Merrill's name were mentioned on as maybe appearing on a show in Central Florida. Wow. And Mark has been training at uh, John Tenta's gym. Well, maybe they're looking to get out of the house. <laughs> hey, Jim, i got to ask you, before Big Show left, what was his weight? Okay, I, and let me put this, put this controversy to rest now. Uh, the man's never going to be a skeleton. But uh, Danny Davis personally would supervise his weigh-ins every Friday. And two weeks before the Garden Show, which was January 31st, uh, Big Show weighed in at 414. In front of Danny Davis, who does not lie and who has no reason to, um, I personally, you know, it's hard for me to tell because I was around Show all the time from the time he came in. He was a lot smaller when he when he went back to the WWF than he was when he got here. Um, you know, I don't know what the controversy was because 414 pounds is probably still more than he ought to weigh, and I'm not saying that he's uh, got the, the cardio to give Benoit a run for his money, but he did lose the weight. Now, we, we didn't weigh him for the two weeks in between um, the you know the last weigh-in and the garden show, which was his last day here, and I don't know whether he went home and had a big picnic or not, but <laughs> I know that two weeks before January 31st, his weigh-in was 414. And how's Mark Henry doing? Mark Henry is doing phenomenal. Mark Henry weighs 322 pounds now. He signed his contract at 415. And Mark is, is he looks like a different human being. Um, he, he's still working on, see, he, he was rushed into the business and he didn't get all the, the basics that he should have and he's sort of, you know, having his career run in reverse now and that he's learning things he should have already known and he's already done things that he should yet to be doing. But uh, he has worked hard since he's been here. He's popular in the locker room. He's lost, um, I think he came here at 380-something. He's lost that weight. He looks like a different human being. He's doing leapfrogs and monkey flips. Um, you know, now they basically they've got to find a spot for him. But I believe when you see Mark Henry back in the WWF, he'll weigh probably in the neighborhood of 310 pounds, and he'll be doing a lot of things that he could never do before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm not going to try to sell people that Mark Henry is the next coming to Ric Flair, uh, but I'm going to say that Mark Henry is now better than, than anybody ever thought he was going to be in this business. And he's worked very hard at it. Cool. What's, uh, what's the status of uh, Leviathan right now? Uh, Leviathan uh, tore, uh, partially tore or tore, depending on the doctor you want to listen to, uh, an ankle ligament uh, several weeks ago, and he's just about ready to come back. Okay. So he did just a you know misfortunate accident. wasn't anybody's fault. Um, was that, you know, was that before? Was that before or after the big the, the show? Oh, that that was after. That was as a matter of fact about a week or ten days after the Garden Show. Now, and, I, uh, I, I'm sorry. I haven't talked to you. Okay, I, 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 I haven't talked to you about this, but um, you know that show, of course, was supposed to take place in December, and then you had the snowstorm and everything, and you had to move everything back. How is it? Because I know the way you book, and you book far in advance, <laughs> and your angles peak at a certain time. And I mean, granted, with the the WWF guys, they were involved in transitions for your guys and angles that they that they were involved. And obviously, you had to put stuff on hold for six weeks, and you had to change stuff. And, I um, was I was not a pleasant person to live with. I was stalking around the house a lot, pulling at my hair, and I I kicked several small dogs. But we made it work somehow. Uh, it's hard to to peak for the greatest matches anybody has ever seen on December 13th, and then tell them, well, you know what, we're going to have them seven weeks from now. 
Hold on right there. <laughs> but we, you know, we did the best we could and made it work, and the show came off well. And and uh, and I apologize for not getting a tape of the raw footage out to you, but we're we're finishing up the production on the home video now at ovwrestling.com where you can place your orders. And um, I will I will make sure you get one, Dave, so you can see what we were talking about. Was there a reason that you chose to postpone it seven weeks? Was it just because that, that was their that was their that was their schedule, not yours, right? Well, it was a combination. See, we, you got to think. We got to obviously OVW schedule for something like that's easy to work with, but we got to have an open date in the building, and we've got to have an open date where all those WWF stars can come back. Mm -hmm. And obviously, being as it was still the dead of the winter, we didn't want you know them to be in Portland, Oregon one night and then have to come to Louisville on January 31st. You don't have to worry about them being in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> Well, you know, yeah, the yeah. West Coast or some far-flung place. So <laughs> it worked out that in January, the schedule, they were in Columbus, Ohio the night before for SmackDown. The Gardens was open on the 31st, and we could do it. So that's, that's the way that came to be. It was, uh, you know, just getting all the pieces in place again. Mm -hmm. anybody, um, anybody else as far as uh, guys that you're really seeing turn the corner, um, as far as, uh, you know, guys or, or, or guys that you have, that do not have WWF deals that you want to get WWF deals? Um, fortunately, with the exception, and we talked about Jason Lee and Derek King as a team earlier, who I think are, are you know, so entertaining and, and do deserve to have a spot somewhere, maybe not as World Tag Team Champions, but somewhere. Um, you know, also a guy who works for us, uh, a couple of guys who work for us, Sean Casey and Chris Michaels, are, are good young talents that, that once again, you know, maybe they don't have the size to be the World Heavyweight Champion, but uh, they do deserve to make money in this business. Uh, almost everybody else um, here, and I can mention Damien also, obviously, the Disciples of Sin, because uh, right now I don't think it's any secret. Uh, Payne has a deal, and Damien doesn't yet. But uh, like I said, that was the match that tore the house down at the gardens. Damien, Payne, and Sin against Matt and Jeff Hardy and Lita, and it, obviously the Hardys and Lita being over didn't hurt it, but Payne and Damien and Sin stepped up and carried their into things, and... Uh, they're a good tag team, and I think Damien ought to, ought to be in the, the running or the contention. Um, you know, a, a guy who gives his heart and soul every time out is, is Toilet Park Trash, and Trash, of course, is blessed with having the absolute worst body in the history of genetics, uh, but he fits his, his gimmick, and he's a, a great worker. Um, but, you know, I don't think he, uh, without cosmetic surgery, has the look they're looking for. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> you know, most everybody else here right now has, has a developmental deal, but I can tell you that... Um, as far as our homegrown talent, the guys that started with OVW and trained here, uh, Rob Conway, the Damager, Nick Dinsmore, and Flash, you know, unfortunately, uh, fortunately for them, unfortunately maybe for other folks, whether they have the big contracts or whether they won the NCAA title or whether they play pro football or not, those are still the go-to guys in this territory because they they started with wrestling, they concentrate on wrestling, and that's what they do, and they, they do it very well. And I think those guys, sooner or later, Despite the fact that they may not be, uh, you know, giants, or they may not have, uh, you know, these mainstream sports credentials, they're going to be up there because they they have just knocked their themselves out to do it the right way. I, I can't really I can't really fault any of the guys we've got here right now because, you know, even even down to the Eric Angles and 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 uh, yeah, Brian Keck, who uh, was an alternate on the U.S. Olympic wrestling team and and has only been here a few months and had never really studied wrestling before. Even the guys who who come here who don't have any background in pro wrestling. They they try their best and they they try to adapt and they try to get in there and they bust their ass and I can't fault hard work, you know. So it remains to be seen whether any of those guys are going to become great talents in this business or not. But as long as they try and they give it their effort, then I think they should have a shot and they should be at least given an open mind. What about David Nelson? Uh, David Nelson, mind is closed. Um, <laughs> David Nelson uh, is, is no longer on a developmental deal. Uh, David did not have the attitude to get along with the other boys. David did not have the attitude to realize that he was starting from scratch in a business he didn't know much about, and he needed to open his eyes and open his ears and close his mouth. And that's what David mm -hmm. Nelson's problem was. And unfortunately, you can't exactly hold a guy up who most people have never met as a, as a, uh, a role model. But if I could, I would I would say to any guy who wants to get a deal with the WWF or anywhere else, whether it be in Memphis or even WCW, whatever, I don't care what you've done in any other business. I don't care how big you are, how strong you are, how tough you are, or how smart you are. If you don't know anything about professional wrestling, it's a whole new ball game and it's a different business. And if you just can place some trust in the people that are training you and open your ears and close your mouth and learn and respect it and do your best, and get along with the other boys because you're no better than they are, um, that's the best thing you can do. 
And guys who have not done that in the past are the guys who went away and you didn't hear anything more about them. Did have we he, talked did about he have... the Tough Enough videos yet? No, uh, we have no, not. I have we, not. We've never talked to about Tough Enough, no. <laughs> did you ever see me those promos on Raw? Um, I did a, a couple, yeah. And, and now I understand why, you know, the, the, the wrestling business is so tough because evidently if that's the way that most people do it, then it's hard, also hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not... Uh, I, I'm, I'm not really familiar with the entire concept of what they're going to do. I'm ambivalent in my feelings about the idea of airing the videotapes from, you know, regular folk because that tends to, to look a little cheesy in my opinion. Um, and if they find somebody that they think that they can train to be a wrestler, God bless them, but it ain't a three-month course. It's not a set. This, this business isn't a five-year course. Um, you know, Ric Flair, I'm sure, will admit to you that he learns something almost every time he gets in the ring of any significance. It's something you continue to learn, and you've got to have an aptitude for it to begin with. And um, anytime somebody thinks they're going to train to be a wrestler and, and start from scratch, and in six months they're great, well, they're either great, they're Kurt Angle, or they're crazy. Because they just don't <laughs> that have was, that was That was the exception. Well, with, with, with David Nelson, now, did he have a problem mentally, of course, in losing matches to smaller guys? Because... I just remember watching him on your tapes. Yeah, he, well, he had a... He had a and and, and you, it, he, he would walk in the ring, and I could tell he was going to do a job. And because he had that attitude, and, and it was like his, it was one of those guys, kind of like with Luger with uh, Palumbo a couple weeks ago, where it's like he would put, he would lose matches, but he would do it in such an uninspired way that the guy who beat him didn't even get over. Well, exactly, and a lot of the veterans have perfected that art to where they can do it on purpose. But David didn't know how to do it; he was just doing it by accident. Because you know, <laughs> but that wasn't even his biggest problem. He had a real problem. Um, uh, just being one of the boys, and he, he had uh, several conflicts with several of the guys here, all of them the blame pretty well placed on David Nelson. I'm not trying to slander the guy when he's gone. I, I told him this sometimes to his face. The next promo you cut, you'll be cutting it at home because we're going to send you home. And then finally, you know, the time came. He, he, he thought that he was above the status of a lowly developmental wrestler in this business after training for six weeks. Um, he was very... Uh, uh, wrapped up in himself, and, and he didn't have the right attitude, and he didn't uh, deal with authority well, he didn't deal with the other boys well. And uh, athletically and physically, he had every gift in the world that you'd want to where he could have had several, you know, six-figure years in this business, but mentally, um, he thought he was a little bit too good for it, uh, right to, you know, to be starting from scratch. Now, did they send him to Memphis, or what, what did you call They were going to send him to Memphis, but um, he, he uh, suddenly realized on Tuesday that he had injured his knee on Thursday when he found out that he was going to have to drive 800 miles round trip to Memphis and back and also to put Leviathan over on television. So he decided to have his knee scoped, and that um, was probably a great decision on his part because that gave everybody a chance to say, well, you know what, we'll rethink this and go our separate ways. Mm. We are totally out of time. Joe, I want to thank you very much for doing the show, and... Uh... Of course, Jim's got uh, Ohio Valley Wrestling, OBWrestling.com. Thank you, uh, Dave. Hey, you're, very, you're, very, you're very welcome. And uh, I, I tell you, if you, are, if you are a fan of Mid-South Wrestling, I, I always tell this to people. If you want to see Mid-South Wrestling, there's no Ted DiBiase's there, but there's a lot of guys who are, um, there are a lot of guys who are training, and, and a half a dozen guys or so or more who are going to end up being stars in the business, and you want to see them basically before anyone else sees them. Um, those are good tapes to get. I mean, I enjoy them. I enjoy what I like. What I like about him the most is that whenever I watch him, I never get annoyed ever at any of the angles. I never feel it's like I never feel insulted. Sometimes the angles don't look particularly good, but the intent is there. Hey, but, that's the best compliment I could ask for. You know what? Even though you could be the greatest chef in the world, but sometimes the cake just doesn't rise. <laughs> but no, it's it's. I, I mean, I, I I love like uh, the commentary and the and the, the storylines and. You know, the, the logic and the fact that, that wins and losses somehow play something instead of, like, just being ignored the minute after the match is over? Um, if, 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 you, if, if you're having a race and you don't have a finish line or a goal, then nobody cares how fast you run or where you're going. Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes we, we talk about, you know, all the stuff that we talk about um, on the show, you know, Jim Cornette kind of books in that same way, so it's real fun for me to watch it. Anyway, I uh, want to thank everyone for joining in. This was an entertaining show, as usual, with Jim Cornette, and uh, we will be back tomorrow at 5.